Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Good evening and welcome to World Affairs Council Washington DC's World Affairs Today program. This evening we are turning our attention to drone warfare and the debate going on surrounding the use of drones by the CIA and the US military. Perhaps I should say um, debates going on because there are, there are, there are many issues uh, to discuss of course related to the use of drones. There's the legal issue. The White House memo argues that the use of drones is legal but Heretofore, the final word on legality in this country comes from the court, so I think there'll probably be some discussion going on regarding le legality for some years to come. And then there's the moral issue generally, and there's the matter of targeting U.S. citizens abroad and other issues. But tonight we're going to look primarily at the use of drones as a foreign policy matter. Is their effectiveness worth the potential blowback? or as General Stanley McChrystal has expressed skepticism about drones, suggesting that the resentment they create is greatly underestimated in this uh, here at home and, and, and may not, not be worth the benefits that they supposedly have. Or are they to be appreciated as a hands-off, less expensive, both in monetary terms and in terms of not sending ground troops into harm's way tool that can be used? We are pleased to have three individuals here with us who examine the use of drones as a foreign policy tool uh, this evening. We have Alfred Elkins, is the founder and president of the Center for Applied Strategic Excellence and the chief inventor of Vertizotan? Vertizonal. Vertizonal Inc., sorry. Previously, he served in the Future Initiatives Directorate at the Joint Warfare Analysis Center in Dahlgren, Virginia. During his nearly 30-year nearly career in the Navy, he has held a diverse array of positions as a lead planner, a chief of naval operations intelligence briefing officer, and base transition coordinator. He specializes in future concept development. Dr. Christopher Swift is an adjunct professor of national security studies at Georgetown University and a fellow at the University of Virginia's Law School, Center for National Security Law. An attorney and political scientist, Dr. Swift specializes in international law and contemporary armed conflict. His forthcoming book, The Fighting Vanguard, Local Insurgencies in the Global Jihad, features Al-Qaeda's relationships with indigenous militants based on his field research in Afghanistan and Yemen. Sarah Sorcher will be our moderator this evening. She is a staff reporter covering national security and foreign policy for the National Journal. She was a regular contributor to ABC News, Global Post, Israel 21C. Her video productions have made frequent appearances in prominent media outlets, including the New York Times Online, Time, and CNN Worldview. Her recent article is Obama's drone policy really morally superior to torture, and the backlash against drones examined the controversy of the U.S. drones program and the impact on the public's concerns regarding drone policy as well as privacy issues. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel. Thank you very much for the introduction and for having me here with these wonderful panelists. I think it should be a great discussion. I've been asked to give some background information on the drone strike program and outline a few areas of controversy and then I'll turn it over to our panelists to give their opening remarks. So I want to talk a little bit about the United States fairly recent history with targeted killing when the CIA and military used drones to take out suspected terrorists overseas in countries like Pakistan or even further away from conventional battlefields in places like Yemen and Somalia. Since President Obama took office in 2009, drone strikes have drastically increased, but the program has also been shrouded in secrecy. Obama first publicly acknowledged the program last January, actually in a Google Plus video chat. He said that a lot of these strikes have been along Pakistan's border area near Afghanistan to go after al-Qaeda suspects in very tough terrain. Since then, a few Obama administration officials have come out to publicly explain and defend the program over the last year. And they claim that the strikes are legal under the Congressional Authorization for Use of Military Force in 2001 after the September 11th terrorist attacks. And we'll get into some of those legal questions here too with Dr. Swift. Um, but surprisingly, even though the, the program has been publicly acknowledged for a while now, 
widespread debate and controversy hasn't actually taken hold until recent weeks. Um, that's because John, Br that's, it's increased because John Brennan, who helped build the administration's drone strategy as White House counterterrorism advisor, was tapped to become CIA director. And also the Justice Department white paper outlining some of the administration's perceived justifications for killing suspected American uh, terrorists abroad was leaked to the media, and as many of you know, that created quite a stir here in Washington. Um, but overall, even in the recent public discussions and the congressional hearings and um, editorials of major newspapers, Congress and the press overall seem less interested in questioning the legitimacy of drone strikes themselves than they do in the process and the secrecy surrounding them. Some people are concerned that Obama plays a key role in personally approving the strikes for people on the so-called kill list that's determined by an interagency process and that there's no court involved. Other people are concerned that there's little insight into how the administration perceives its rights to take out terrorists overall, since it won't release all of its secret legal opinions even to Congress. And of course, much of the debate and the concern in the states has also focused on the, on the issue of killing Americans abroad. Some experts say that we might not even be having this discussion if Anwar al-Awlaki, the Yemen-based radical cleric, had not been killed in a drone strike um, in 2011, along with Samir Khan, another American who ran a publication propagating terrorism. But there are actually much broader questions that go to the heart of the drone program itself, and we'll tackle some of those here today. Could drone strikes open Pandora's box and lead us down a path toward an unchecked executive branch, leave the door open for possibly other countries to eventually use the same technology to take out whomever they see fit? Or could it prove to be more of a panacea for the challenges that we face today in the current phase of the war on terror? And I believe that Mr. Elkins is going to address some of those questions as well. Virtually no members of Congress, as of now, are loudly questioning the legitimacy of the drone strikes themselves. And Americans also broadly say that they support the strikes overseas. In a recent CBS News poll, some 71% of Americans said that they were in favor of the drone program. And their support, in many ways, makes a lot of sense. The strikes have been successful, and they've taken out key militants in recent years, including Abu Yahya al-Libi, former second-in-command of al-Qaeda. And even civil libertarians here at home complain that it's hard to gain much traction in criticism of the program or how it's being used, in part because so far the government um, is not providing any official count of the number of strikes or the alleged militants that have been killed or their identities or how many innocent civilian bystanders may have died. So this makes the public debate, at least so far, a largely one-sided one. The drones are a low-risk, low-intensity tactic and a fitting callback mode for a war-weary public, an irregular enemy, and a budget crisis. Drones can go after threats without having to occupy countries or send thousands of troops to faraway places. And um, all this, combined with public support, means that it is very likely here to stay, especially as the war winds down in Afghanistan. So as you can see, we have a lot here to discuss, and I don't want to go on for too long. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Swift and then Mr. Elkins for their opening remarks. And then um, I'll have a few questions for them before we take some from the audience. So thanks, and let's get to it. Okay. So I, I'll go first? Sure. OK. Um, good evening and welcome. I uh, appreciate you all coming. This is a very controversial issue, so I'm going to do my very best to provide uh, legal analysis that's based on my work as an international and constitutional lawyer, um, but also some insight from my research uh, the last seven years <coughs> into al-Qaeda and indigenous insurgencies, uh, including my experience on the ground this past summer in, uh, in Yemen, which is where uh, these operations are currently at their, uh, at their apex. Um, first, looking at drones as a platform, as a tactical attribute, and their tactical attributes, and Al will get into this in far greater detail than I ever could. But as a general rule, drones increase our reach operationally. They improve our capacity for reconnaissance, and they improve our capacity for surveillance. Now, don't confuse reconnaissance and surveillance with intelligence. Intelligence usually requires, you know, an understanding of what's happening on the ground. These are aerial platforms, right? So it's, um, it's a, a net improvement on what we can do, but it doesn't obviate the need to have human contact with people in the field. Um, drones also reduce the risks and the costs associated or attendant to intervening in foreign theaters of war. We can operate these things, you know, via over the horizon via satellites in a completely different country. Drone pilots may be, you know, here in the continental United States rather than in theater. And the footprints associated with drone operations usually run in the 30 to 120 personnel size, per, depending on how big the, the operating 
platform is. So we're not talking about massive investments of personnel. We're not talking about massive investments of blood and treasure and time. Um, and so that fits very nicely, that modality, this instrumentality fits very nicely with a broader shift we've seen in the global war on terrorism, and that is a shift from expensive, protracted, often very bloody and very costly counterinsurgency operations in places like Afghanistan and Iraq <coughs> towards a lighter footprint, lower cost, lower intensity, um, but very, very focused counterterrorism operations using drones, using special operations forces and using other sort of more surgical platforms. I want to put the term surgical in quotations because, again, it really depends on the operation whether it's surgical or not and not on our description of it. Um, so that's tactical. Now looking at the, the legal questions, and there's two questions we have to ask when we're looking at it from an international legal perspective. The first is, can you intervene in the first place? Can you use force in the first instance? And the second is, if you can use force, what laws or norms would govern your use of force, assuming it is, in fact, legal? Um, so let me look at the, the, the use at bellum question first, the can you get into the war? As a general rule, states are not allowed to go into other states and, to use, and use violence in their sovereign territory, with several exceptions. One of the most important exceptions is what's called foreign internal defense or uh, individual and collective self-defense. Under the United Nations Charter and under customary international law, a sovereign government can reach out to an ally and say, we have an internal problem. Will you please come and help us deal with it? So we've seen the United States do that in places like Colombia, where the U.S. has taken a role in dealing with the narco insurgency in the FARC there. We've seen it in places like Yemen and Pakistan, where we've seen the United States go in using special operations forces in the case of Pakistan and drones in the case of both Pakistan and Yemen to address internal insurgencies that they've had in those countries. Now, as long as the, the duly constituted executive in those countries invites the United States in or consents to the United States coming in and continues to do so, you don't have a violation. The parliament can howl as much as it wants. The press can howl as much as it wants. But as long as the final decision maker representing the state, as long as the head of state or the head of government is making that decision, from an international legal perspective, that is not, uh, that's a permissible use of force. Then we get to the question of what norms and values or laws would restrain one's ability to use force presuming that you can intervene in the first instance. And those include um, civilian immunity. We're, you're not supposed to hit civilians. You're only supposed to hit combatants. That goes back to the Geneva Conventions and the customary international law long before the 47 Geneva Conventions and the, the 79 annexes there too. Um, you're supposed to be targeted force. You're supposed to focus on the source of the threat and not anything around the threat that might be potentially problematic. And the third is the force is supposed to be proportional. You, you, don't, use, um, you don't use a thermonuclear weapon to go after a small cell of insurgents. You use a different kind of tool. So civilian immunity, um, targeted account of, targeting, and proportionality, by and large, are the three three norms that govern how we use force in an international context once it's legal to intervene. Now let's look at this from a const U.S. constitutional perspective. As a general rule, the president <clears throat> is the organ of U.S. foreign relations overseas. He is also the commander in chief. And between those two authorities, which both arise under Article 2.2 of the U.S. Constitution, the president has a lot of leeway. Um, the president has even more leeway when there is congressional authorization to engage in a certain type of action. Um, and the authorization for the use of military force that was passed by the U.S. Congress after September 11th has been used by both the Bush administration and the current administration as sort of supporting evidence um, to, to support what they're doing with respect to their broad application of the president's two, two powers. Now, there's a question as to what degree the federal judiciary is, is likely to intervene in these sort of activities. And as a general rule, lawyers make really bad military commanders. Um, lawyers think about rules. Lawyers think about the context. They start thinking about fact patterns. They start trying to remember what they didn't read in their horn book from law school. And, and that's the kind of deliberation and the kind of getting into the details that doesn't really suit well to a combat environment. Um, and so historically, not just in the last 10 years, not just in the last 30 years, but in the last 237 years, the federal judiciary has deferred to the political branches, i.e. the President and the Congress, on the prosecution of wars. 
Now, when it comes to persons that are within U.S. jurisdiction or within U.S. control, then the judiciary starts to get involved. But when you're talking about what's happening on the battlefield, the courts like to stay away from that. One, because they're not qualified to deal with it, and two, because it's an area that's really essentially political rather than legal, even though law restrains the use of force in some very important ways that we'll discuss this evening. The law doesn't dictate how and when force is used in a tactical or operational environment. Um, so if we look at the President's Article 2.2 authorities and we look at the congressional authorization, and we put both of those things together, you have sort of a presidential power plus. Now, I have some problems with the congressional authorization. We can get into that in our discussion later this evening. But if you look at the Supreme Court's jurisprudence on the foreign affairs power, the President's foreign affairs power, they say in a case called Youngstown Sheet and Tube back from 1947, I think it was, that when the President and Congress are on the same side, the judiciary is going to take a tremendous amount, a very deferential position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the activities of the political branch. But when the President and Congress are opposed to one another, there's more space for the judiciary to get involved because there isn't the same kind of political consensus. Well, right now in the United States, we don't have a whole lot of division between the, United, the U.S. President and the U.S. Congress <coughs> over the use of drones or the prosecution of the war on terrorism generally. So unless there is another issue, i.e. a civil rights issue or a civil liberties issue, the courts are unlikely to intervene. So what does that mean in terms of the use of drones? It means as long as the operation is occurring in a foreign theater of war against a foreign adversary of the United States, the courts are probably going to stay out of it. What if you have a U.S. citizen involved, as in the case of Anwar al -Awaki? Well, then the Fifth Amendment starts to pick in. The Fifth Amendment says that the government cannot take your life, your liberty, or your property. They can't execute you, imprison you, tax you, or you know, take things from, or tax you or fine you, unless you have due process of law. And so if you look at the Justice Department memorandum that was leaked a couple weeks ago, this is really the issue that the Justice Department is wrestling with. To what extent does the Fifth Amendment apply in cases like this, where you have a senior operational leader, as they define al, al, al operating in a foreign theater of war? Um, personally, I think there are some major problems with the Justice Department's Fifth Amendment jurisprudence. Um, I agree with their assertion that the Fifth Amendment would not attach because we are dealing with an individual who's in a foreign theater of war, um, sorry, who is in a foreign country, that country is a foreign theater of war, and that individual is either carrying arms against or conspiring against the United States or its allies. Right? If you meet all three of those conditions, I think the Justice Department is on firm grounds. The area where I have some problems with the Justice Department is really in their conception and framing of the Fifth Amendment and the whole question of imminence. And, and in U.S. Fifth Amendment jurisprudence, uh, the government is allowed to use lethal force to protect the police, to protect property, to protect the population. But they can only do it as long as the criminal or the other person that they're trying to arrest is using lethal force in that instance. So if, if a bank robber is shooting at you as they're trying to run away, you can shoot back at them. If they take a hostage, you can use force to try to save that person. But if the bank robber puts down their weapon and goes around the corner to get a Starbucks, you can't touch him. You have to arrest him. You can't just go up and shoot him. Right? So the imminence is gone. The imminent threat is gone. We have the same concept in international law, and, and that concept is if a country is just about to invade you, not two weeks from now, not six years from now, not maybe when they get a nuclear weapon, um, or if a, a terrorist group is just about to run an operation across the border and do something nasty, then you can engage in what's called preemptive self-defense. Uh, and that's been a concept in, in U.S. law and in international law since the 1840s and Daniel Webster's uh, Caroline Doctrine, which actually arose from a, a nasty little border dispute we were having with the Canadians. Um, so there's a distinction between those two things. So if we look at the Fifth Amendment jurisprudence, I have some problems with it. But on balance, as long as you can meet the following criteria, that is a foreign country that is at war and the individual subject to the targeting is either carrying arms against or conspiring against the United States and its allies and or its allies, that's a very, very small universe of individuals, by the way, then I think the President has, the adequ has adequate authority under the Constitution to do this, and I don't think the Fifth Amendment would attach. If you change that to an operation in the United States, well, geez, the Fifth Amendment would attach, right? So if you have an An Anwar al awaki or one of his disciples at the Red Roof Inn in Boise, Idaho, that's going to be a police operation, not a targeted killing. Right? If it's London or Paris or Moscow or even Riyadh, 
right? And you don't have a theater of war, even though it's a foreign country, and even though that individual might be conspiring against the United States and its allies, you don't have the battlefield scenario that would allow the use of the drone, the, that would allow the use of the military instrument. You'd have to collaborate with their local security services. So when you go through those criteria, it starts to look less unreasonable or much more constrained um, than has been normally communicated in the media. Um, good evening, and let me echo on this uh, rainy night. Thanks for coming out. Um, I am a concepts guy, and so I'm going to talk to you about uh, th something that I want you to use some spare cycles in your brain housing group tonight to think about. And I'm going to ask you to explicitly think about these using spare cycles back here in this part of your brain. And the thing that I want you to think about is how you do things today with a small percentage of resources to set conditions so that you can exploit evolving conditions in some uncertain future. What do you do with some resources today to set conditions so that you can exploit or explore later conditions in some uncertain future? To hedge bet, if you will. Okay, now before I get all serious and lower my voice to a baritone and start talking about technology, let me give you a couple anecdotes. One of the things that Stephanie suggested I talk about, or maybe, yeah, I guess with Stephanie, was uh, uh, talk a little bit about the history of where we came from. It's always good to understand how we got to this thing we call a drone today. And I hate to call it a drone because it reminds me of some of the jobs I had where I was actually a drone. So I prefer to call them uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, you may have heard this term before, UAVs. If you've got enough gray hair, you might have called it an RPV, a remotely piloted vehicle, and that term's gone away. Sometimes you'll hear a UAS, unmanned aircraft, not aerial, but unmanned aircraft system, and that's the whole ball of wax. That includes the thing in the sky, the ground station, the people, everything, all the things that Dr. Swift talked about as far as footprint. When I was a young buck in the Navy, uh, sometimes my first ship was an aircraft carrier, and I used to walk around with a lieutenant commander that uh, I was an ensign, of course, at the time, and this lieutenant commander that uh, I worked for, we'd walk around on the flight deck sometimes when we weren't flying. And uh, I thought he was so old and wise, and now I realize he's 15 years younger than I would, am right now, so uh, I guess that makes me really smart. But what he would do is he'd walk around, and at least once or twice a day while we were walking on the flight deck, we owned a lot of equipment on the flight deck, so we, it was necessary for us to do that. He'd go like this, here it comes. And we had a warrant officer who worked for us, and one day, I, I didn't want to say anything to the boss, so one day I said to the warrant, oh, Warren, what's he, why does John do that? Why does he do that? Here it comes. He said, oh, well, let me tell you a little story about the DASH helicopter. Now, DASH is an acronym for Drone Anti-Submarine Helicopter. And these were built in the 60s. They had... Uh, coaxial propellers, which meant they were two propellers on the same shaft, provides a lot of lift for the helicopter, um, but um, what it means is that blades have to be a little bit shorter, which is good, but they have to be widely separated because of uh, the flexing of the blades, and so that makes the helicopter very maneuverable, but it's also very dangerous and a lot of complexity in that helo. Well, um, that was fine for a drone. No one really cared. They were relatively small, had a small footprint. They'd fly 22 miles from the ship. They'd drop a torpedo on a submarine that was unexpected. Um, and it seemed to be a great thing, except that Gyrodyne, the company that built Dash, used commercial off-the-shelf electronics for about 80% of Dash. So we built about 700 and some Dashes, and 400 of them went away and never came back, and so, except for the one that my boss flew off of his ship because after three or four hours of not being able to communicate with their dash, it came flying across the bow, and then it came flying across the stern, and it flew across the bow, It'd go over the horizon, just come back to the ship at random intervals. And after a while, the uh, ship felt that this was some sort of poltergeist, and so that's why he became addicted to saying, here it comes, there it is. Which he did, I mean, this was 20 years later. Well, interestingly enough, uh, uh, Dash was also bought by the Japanese, and the Japanese lost less than 5% of their aircraft. So uh, whether it was operator error, whether it was electronics, whether the Japanese refitted it, that has never been identified. But um, there was a lot of things that before Dash, in fact, we've been trying to fly things remotely 
since we first tried, started to fly. One of the most notable things was uh, Elmer Sperry of Sperry Corporation, still around in one form or another today. He's been in a lot of different iterations. Elmer and his, and his son began to work on an aerial torpedo, and they, bifitted, they, they backfitted Curtis biplanes with radio-controlled device and filled it with lots and lots of high explosive. And the goal was to launch them from catapults and fly them out and let them attack enemy, enemy uh, uh, bivouacs. Well, it didn't work 99% of the time. They crashed or they flew away. <laughs> had my boss been around, and I thought he had been, he looked old enough at the time. Had my boss been around <laughs> during World War I era, I, he probably would have been saying, here it comes at that point too. Elmer Sperry, by the way, is very enthusiastic about this, hel this aerial torpedo because why? It was supposed to be so devastating a weapon that no one would ever try to start a war again. And this was a very common thought of weapons designers during that time frame, that we would build something that was so heinous, no one would ever start any kind of conflict again. Well, the horrors of World War I suggested otherwise. Uh, in World War II, the Germans began to deploy drone bombs that were launched from heavy bombers um, and steered into their targets with a remote-controlled stick. Not the same as the rocketry that we got with the V-1 and V-2, but still just as lethal, not, not, not quite the same lethality, but it was, it was a, the, a nascent beginning of this kind of idea that we can fly things from some sort of distance. Probably one of the most interesting and uh, uh, pop culture-ish uh, reminiscences of the uh, drone, uh, the entire drone industry was during World War II, uh, actually just before World War II, there was an actor, some of you may have remember the name uh, Reginald Denny if you're a film buff. Not the Reginald Denny from the LA riots, but the Reginald Denny who was in Rebecca and his last acting job was in a it was in the Batman television show in 1966. Reginald Denny was actually quite a good actor, but his real hobby and passion was building radio-controlled aircraft. Now, how did he get into that? He was a navigator and a gunner during World War I. After that, he became a stunt pilot. He was a really good actor, so he came to the U.S., went to Hollywood, made a bunch of silent films, got into the talkies, and, and was a great character actor throughout his career. One day, while he was waiting on a set for a scene to start, he saw a young neighborhood boy trying to fly a remote-controlled airplane. And uh, the kid crashed it. Then he came over and said, I know how to do this. I'm as good at this as I am at acting. So he went over and tried to help the young man fix his airplane. Didn't get it flying, as it turns out. But he went to a couple of uh, business colleagues of his and said, you know, I remember one of the problems we had in World War I was targets. We're starting to fly a lot of airplanes. This guy, Billy Mitchell, has just proved that airplanes are going to be the wave of the future. They're going to need targets. And so he founded the Radio Plane Corporation. And they built about 15,000 of them and were used predominantly as targets. After that, Denny's company produced a lot of radio uh, remote-controlled models. One of them was bought by actor Robert Montgomery. I mean, they were, these were for the fi they were the Lexuses of uh, remote-controlled airplanes. A good friend of Denny's was uh, Captain Ronald Reagan, Army Captain Ronald Reagan, and he said to Ron Reagan, um, "Hey, you know, it would be great if we could get some morale-boosting photos of the of the factory." So if a photographer came took some pictures. There was a young woman in there named Norma Jean Doherty. Her husband was on a, in the Merchant Marine fighting at sea. They took pictures of Norma Jean Doherty, and the photographer said, you know, you are very photogenic. You should get a modeling job. And so she did. And the rest of the story? <laughs> Marilyn Monroe. So um, her career was started because of uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, I'll say two more things. One is, in the 50s and 60s, um, rockets had become so powerful, a, uh, uh, pun intended, had become so powerful a technology. Um, we had so many German rocket scientists who had come over to the U.S. that uh, remote piloted vehicles took a back seat. There were a lot of tinkering on the margins for surveillance and reconnaissance, but they weren't really uh, used a lot. Um, 
Then in February 2002, the first predator killing by CIA in uh, Paktia province in Afghanistan. Um, so from that very small beginning with Elmer Sperry to a, less than 100 years later, we're using precision guided munitions to take out an individual target. How did that happen? Two things. One, microprocessors. Two, GPS. Both of which the U.S. and Great Britain allowed to proliferate, along with cell phone technology, starting in the 1970s. So everything's connected. Ronald Reagan, Marilyn Monroe. Thank you. Thanks so much. So um, my first question will be for uh, Dr. Swift. Um, I want to hear a little bit more about the field research that you've been doing in Yemen, and um, what are people's perceptions of the drone strikes there? You mentioned that people didn't like them so much, but um, how do you weigh, or how should the U.S. weigh, the tactical benefit of the strikes with, um, you know, this possible strategic blowback from countries like in Pakistan or in sure. Yemen? Um, let me state at the outset, Sarah, in answering that question, I'm not going to answer it from a legal perspective. Um, because the legality and morality is a different set of uh, assessments that need to be made rather than the, the, the tactical efficacy of a particular instrument or the political consequences of using that instrument. Um, it's, a, it's sort of a preliminary assessment, but it's, it's not the question that answers, it's not the answer that answers your question. Um, when I, I went to Yemen with the objective of understanding how Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, which is one of the franchises, uh, of al the al-Qaeda movement interfaces with the indigenous Yemeni population. Um, unlike almost every other place where al-Qaeda is operating, uh, al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is an indigenous movement that's globally informed, which is to say that its members are predominantly uh, Yemeni or Saudi. Um, they speak Arabic. They're not Arabic speakers in Pakistan or Arabic speakers trying to operate in a place like Bosnia or Chechnya or Indonesia. So the interface, some of the challenges that Al Qaeda faces as a movement, uh, or has faced as a movement internationally, have been removed because they're essentially operating on home turf. Uh, and I wanted to understand that relationship um, from the ground up, and that's why I went there. Um, I did not go intending to study the drone question, but I had friends who were lawyers in the human rights community, and I had colleagues who were analysts and operators in the national security community who wanted me to ask the question. You know, are the drones helping Al Qaeda recruit? You know, are the drones helping Al Qaeda more than they are hurting them? Mm -hmm. And what is the perception of the and what is the general perception of the U.S. intervention and U.S. drone strikes generally? And and depending on who I asked, I get different variations of those questions. But of the 40 people that I interviewed, and when I say interview, I mean like a a, a lengthy two to three hour structured deposition style interview. Um, with a lot of structured questions and a comparison across the data set from individual to individual, uh, none of them believed that drone strikes were the primary cause of al-Qaeda recruiting. None of them even believed it was one of the major causes. Um, yes, there was some anecdotal evidence of particular people in particular regions choosing to join al-Qaeda as a result of something that may have happened to a family member, but on a systemic basis that, that anecdotal da data that's been reported in the Washington Post and NPR and elsewhere, if you extrapolate it out and you look at how Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula has grown from about 300 members circa 2009 to about 1,000 members plus some seasonal auxiliaries uh, today, it doesn't make enough sense. There's, there's not enough to sustain that, to sustain that geometric growth um, based on the, the anecdotal data. Um, so overwhelmingly, that what they told me was it was economic factors. It was economic incentives that were driving them in. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that the drones are seen, that Yemenis endorse drones. I mean, as I wrote in Foreign Affairs, and as I wrote in The Atlantic last week, overwhelmingly, Yemenis see the drones as, uh, through the context or through the lens of Americans, America's interventions in places like Iraq, or Israel's intervention, in, or Israel's activities in uh, the Palestinian Authority and the Gaza Strip. It's, it's all wrapped up in that us versus them mentality that's been informed by decades of, of reaction to colonialism and then the neo-colonial movements, the Arab nationalist movements, and now the, the contemporary, you know, political Islamist movements, not necessarily militant movements, but, you know, political organizations like the Muslim Brotherhood. And that's all wrapped up, and it's wrapped up very, very tightly. So there's a sovereignty concern. I had Yemenis tell me, you know, we don't really care about the drones. Um, if you let us fly the drones, we'd be more than happy to, to, to take care of al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is our adversary, too. But our problem is when you come in and you do it, 
Um, I had one individual, and I, I quoted him in Foreign Affairs, uh, tell me that the problem for him and for the people in his community was not when we go and hit people like Anwar al -Awaki. Uh His view and the view of many other people I interviewed was this individual picked a fight with the United States, and the United States settled the fight, and it was a personal thing. Um, their concern was when the U.S. ambassador goes on television and takes credit for these operations. Mm -hmm. Yemenis want to be seen solving Yemeni problems. They want to solve problems. They want to have, be the, the commanders of their own future. And the place where that sentiment, which is very strong, it's very strong in any society, is the strongest is among the Arab Spring generation. It's among the people who are sort of 40 years older and younger. Um, and that generation increasingly views drone strikes or U.S. intervention of any kind as, as prima facie evidence of a, of a corrupt government aligned with a foreign imperialist force. And, and that perception has very little to do with what's going on in the field as you get closer to people who are actually fighting al-Qaeda locally, then you know, they, their, their view of drones started to become more positive because they were benefiting from drone operations in some respects. But as you got into the political elite and especially into the, the younger generation of political activists who are much more removed from what's happening out in the bush, um, that perception is extremely strong. And in my opinion, that perception is reaching such strength that it's starting to undermine the national dialogue and the political processes that we've tried to set in motion in Yemen between now and 2014 in order to stabilize the country politically, elect a new parliament, put a new constitution together, and all of that. So part of strategy is managing the unintended consequences of your operations. Mm -hmm. And our operations can be legal and they can be effective. And I would argue in the case of Yemen they are legal and they are effective, although I understand that's a controversial position. Um, my concern is that their political outcomes are, are really starting to undermine, the political effects are really starting to undermine what we're after in Yemen over the long term, not what we need to achieve with the Yemenis side by side in the short term. Okay, thank you. And I guess from a military perspective, how would you say that drones have changed our military strategy? Um, and what are some of the benefits and drawbacks to using targeted killing as part of a military strategy? And do you think that there's a danger in the U.S. becoming too reliant on, on this tactic? Uh, too much reliance, I think, has low probability because uh, when you think about strategy, it has to be aligned with the adversaries, or it's not really a strategy. It really is just a tactic. So to think about drones, which are UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, as a as part of a strategy or as one element or component of a strategy, you have to think about how you would examine that strategy as a model. Um, one model that in my consulting business we like to use is uh, called the NK model, where N is the number of components that you have and K is the interconnectedness of those components. Um, this is a model designed that was developed by uh, Stuart Kaufman, the physicist and complex systems thinker, and it's, it's used a lot throughout uh, for, for both social sciences, it's in physics, chemistry, it's in the physical sciences, the social sciences, and business. The NK model is, is uh, replete with a lot of uh, gravitas. So if you think about the number of elements of which UAVs, drones, would be one, and the connectedness of all of the strategic elements, the more connected those elements become, the more jagged the landscape is, where you have lots of peaks and valleys in a particular field of view. Now I'm talking about a mathematical or a simulation field of view, not a literal field of view where you'd be looking out over a horizon. And this is important because if you are stuck on one of these peaks, the ability to influence by a marginal improvement becomes much less than if the landscape is relatively smooth, i.e. if there is less interconnectedness. So the more we tie drones to the rest of our global strategy, the harder it will be for us to get off one of these peaks and identify other strategies. So the reliance issue is, is recursive. The more we rely on drones, the more we use them to build our strategy. The more our strategy becomes part of drone warfare, the more we're going to use drones. So it's not as though uh, there's an easy way out. But I will tell you that um, 
I think what a UAV really is, is a sniper. It's a sniper without putting a man in the field. And we know that snipers in legend are highly recognized and highly revered. Um, so I'll ask this question. What would the policy discussion be if the sniper were in space instead of being an air breather? Would it be space drones, Pandora, Spox, or Panacea? Or what about if we put a man inside the drone and call it a AC-130 gunship, Pandora's Box, or Panacea? Or a the Air Force's Warthog airplane, Pandora's Box, or Panacea? I guess my point is, is that if you are suckered into a flat screen, Googleized Intel thinking that that's strategy, instead of, um, and, and you have short term, short horizon ways of looking at the world with very little interest in return on investment in the future, then you're going to think that this is a great policy to use drone strikes as a central tenant, the tip of the spear, if you will. But if you want to step back, remember the very beginning, I said, please use some spare cycles to think about how you would set conditions with technology, processes, organizational structures for some later uncertain future. Then all of a sudden, drones become not so important in how you deal with the world. So I guess continuing on, sorry, did you have something? I just wanted to pick up sure. on that. Um, there are two points about the recursivity I wanted to make. Uh, the first is a lot of that recursivity that Al's referring to is evident in the debate we're having in the United States about drugs. Right? Our, our, de our debate is focused on the technology, about the potentials of the technology, about what's new and different. It's not focused on what's happening on the ground in the places where we're using the drones. Right? What's causing the insurgency, what's sustaining the insurgency, what the, what the political, long-term political consequences of any U.S. intervention in these kinds of environments are. So when you hear me say things, of, when people talk to me about Yemen, they want to talk about al-Qaeda and drones. And when I talk to people about Yemen, I want to talk about water, agriculture, and maternal and child health. Because if you want to defeat al-Qaeda in Yemen, you've really got to look at water, agriculture, and maternal and child health. And that is not a short-term game, right? That is not a tactical thing that you can fix by remote control. It's something that you have to be thinking about in terms of long-term gain and long-term policy. Our emphasis on the legality and efficacy of the platform is eating up a lot of bandwidth that we should be using about uh, to, to think about our policy. And more importantly, to think about the way we can use law to set some of the conditions that Al is talking about that inure to our benefit over the long term. It doesn't necessarily require new laws. It doesn't necessarily require new technologies. It requires understanding our role as agents in the policymaking process and also managing the unintended consequences of our actions. Now, I've never met Chris Swift before tonight. However, I will tell you, it's as though we've been, had this Vulcan mind melt because he said something that I think is really important, and that is that it doesn't take new technology. So remember I said what we want to do is take the interconnectedness and reduce that so we have a flatter landscape, and it's easier to create marginal improvements <laughs> as we move around and try to find different things to do to have a global improvement in what we're doing. One way to do that is to use UAVs, drones, for other purposes. Don't get rid of the technology. Use it for agricultural purposes. Use it for del package delivery into austere areas. Mm -hmm. Use it for setting up ad hoc communications networks. Use it for allowing countries to have better border <laughs> protection and to allow them to uh, do their own policing. So I guess continuing on with that, um, what precedent do you think that the U.S. is setting with the drone strikes? And does our increasing use of this technology um, foreshadow a problem if and when other countries do eventually develop, um, develop it and um, start to use it? And I guess that's also a question mm -hmm. for you from a foreign policy perspective, too. Um, but the drone, in many ways, is just the tip of the spear. You know, it relies on a whole network of satellites and yep. human intelligence and different techniques for actually how to use them. So, I mean, how hard is that system to actually replicate? And um, what is the likelihood of other countries starting to use drones in the same way? That, that's 
that may be one of the most incisive questions here, uh, Sarah, because it doesn't matter what the system is or what business you have. Um, proliferation of your technology is going to happen, and how you deal with that, um, whether you use patent infringement or whether you put a, uh, a small explosive on the technology to keep the person who gets it wrongly blowing up in their face, it doesn't matter how you do it. If you want to protect the technology, you need to think about it. And that may be, and, and it could also be the concept of operations, how you actually use it. So the point is, is how do you allow something to move into a domain, whether it be spatial, intellectual, cognitive, or informational, where it doesn't belong? How do you allow that to happen? Don't disallow it, because that's like keeping all the secrets locked up. They're going to get out. In this, in this case, um, you want to think about things like how you use open source software to keep the violation of the technology to an, in a way where you can actually counter that violation. Um, the other question you asked was precedent. I think that countries that have no legal or historical precedence for uh, humanitarianism or don't provide legal protections from um, people that would do us harm, wouldn't have any problem <coughs> in using or developing technology simply because the U.S. does. Um, we allowed mobile phone technology to proliferate and think about what's been done in the inter international security arena. So I, I don't see the precedent issue as being something that will drive further technology. It will always be Moore's Law and something beyond GPS. It'll be portable, mobile, ubiquitous computing capability that is generated by human body power or some other holographic type of power source that is coming down the pike. But it's not going to be uh, unproliferated because, well, ah, geez, the U.S. uses it for such a humanitarian and legal way. I, you know, we probably shouldn't use it because we're bad guys. <laughs> so. um, you know, I want to say a, a brief word here about the, the role that law plays and how we need to think about international law. In a domestic law context, law is on or off. It's black or white. It's right or wrong. It's like a light switch, right? And that's because we have a government that can enforce the law. In the international context, there is no single enforcement mechanism, right? The enforcement mechanism are all of the different countries that are legally sovereign and have sovereignty over the populations they control. So there's no one world court that will resolve the drone issue for everyone. There's no one standard of international law that's going to be applied every place in the same way. Even when the United Nations Security Council passes a resolution that applies globally, different countries apply that resolution in their own way locally. So when we look at the question of what role does international law have to play or what role does treaty laws or customary international law have to play in the proliferation issue, it's really a normative question, right? It's really a regulatory question. How do we use values to constrain bad political behavior, or to constrain the kind of behavior that makes it more likely that we're going to fight, fight with one another in the future. And when we think of international law, the, the fundamentals are really the same. It's civilian immunity, right? It's proportionality, and it's tar the targeted use of force, the targeted <coughs> selected use of force. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about a manned aircraft, or whether you're talking about a cruise missile, or you're talking about a drone, those same laws still attach. And, and I should say that, you know, when we think about these laws, these our, our values and lessons that our grandparents and our grandparents' grandparents have given to us through generations. And they wrote it down as law so it would have something more than just the authority of history. Right? So when we're looking to these things, we have to realize that the, the, the fault, as Shakespeare would say, is not in the technology, it's not the ghost in the machine. The fault is not in our stars, it's in ourselves. It's in the decisions we make as countries to set standards, to abide by those standards and to use the instrumentalities that we have at our disposal, be they military, political, economic, or otherwise, in the most efficacious manner over the long term, not just the short term. And that's my critique of the, the drone program now, is that it tends to be very, very short term focused rather than serving a longer term strategy. Thanks. So um, I have more questions, but we have time to take some from the audience. If, if you guys want to go to the microphone that's set up over there. Uh, I think one of the key issues in uses of UAVs is the definition of the theater of war. And I think 
we've seen some ambiguities about that in the media, but in conjunction with that, the ways that we have been trying to interpret that touch on a very significant problem in two sides. And that is that an adversary like Al-Qaeda is potentially all over the world. They're not a state. They're, they don't particularly subscribe to rules uh, put out by the UN. And because UAVs are inexpensive, this technology can be developed very readily in other places. And of course, a lot of um, Israel makes some significant U UAVs, platforms, and things like that. Um, I, do, I also want to throw out, so, so the main focus here as a question <coughs> is what about this issue of the definition of the theater, theater of war and the ambiguity of that in trying to deal with um, a terrorist adversary? Um, well, let me give you uh, a, a two theaters where we're operating now and try to show you how that definition differs in both of those places. Um, in the case of Yemen, it, the Yemeni government, including the Yemeni president, here at the Woodrow Wilson Center about two weeks, uh, about two months ago, maybe two or three, um, have openly endorsed the use of U.S. UAVs against Al Qaeda targets in their territory. They have also acknowledged that they are at war with an insurgency within their own territory. So, in the case of Yemen, where they had a major counteroffensive in the south, when I was there in the south this summer, um, it from their local standard and from an objective standard, um, an objectively reasonable person would believe that, you know, a major land invasion of, from one province of a country into another province of a country would constitute a war. I think that's pretty clear that that's a theater of war. Now, if we look at a place like Pakistan in the, the northwest frontier province, um, it becomes a little more complicated, uh, in part because Pakistan is not in a state of war although it is fighting uh, some counterinsurgency operations against various groups within that country. Um, NWFP is not Afghanistan, but you have the hot pursuit issue with people coming over the border from Afghanistan into Pakistan. In that context, the use of UAVs or any other sort of, uh, or any other military instrument could become legal, depending on the circumstances. Um, you also have the Pakistani government offering to the United States in the past, and continuing to assent to certain target sets for the United States to hit in that particular region. Um, they're also running their own operations in that region. So again, it, it's much more subjective in the case of Pakistan, whether it's a theater of war. But if the local government is sort of characterizing it as such, or if they're behaving in a manner that indicates that they themselves are, are view it in that way, or at least view certain actors within that sphere that way, then you know, it it's becomes a more plausible legal argument. If you were to, you know, look at, you know, Al Qaeda plotting in London, right, or Al Qaeda plotting in Paris, or Al Qaeda plotting in Moscow, not that they do or could, but if you're looking at that sort of situation, well all the objective indicia suggest that it's not a theater of <coughs> war. And then our war on terrorism modality, our kinetic modality, our use of military instruments becomes uh, not only more problematic legally, but it also becomes less effective because, the, because of the potential risk to civilians, to the population, to property, to you know, public order. And that's where the role of law enforcement and, and the intelligence community really kicks in. And when we're thinking about how do we cut this balance between kinetic operations on the one hand and law enforcement operations on the other, that, that objective question, are we in a theater of war, is the, is the most important one. Um, there's another question that's sort of subsumed within your description of al-Qaeda that I think is very important, um, and that is who is al-Qaeda, or, or more broadly, who exactly is our adversary? In, in the last 10 years, we have seen enhanced surveillance at home and expanded deployments abroad, but we have not seen the United States government at any point articulate a set of objective criteria for distinguishing al-Qaeda and its closest affiliates from indigenous forms of Islamic militancy. That distinction has never been drawn on a government-wide basis, and it has not been pushed out to the public to debate it and discuss it. Absent those kind of criteria, I think it's going to be very difficult for us to make the kinds of distinctions that you want us to make. I think it's going to be very difficult for us also going forward to legitimize the kinds of actions we're taking if they're seen as interfering with a local society rather than dealing with a transnational terrorist syndicate. I guess you, to some degree, convinced me that drones are a 
technology and that they may not have, may not be proposed issues that are entirely alien to previous military technologies. But I'm wondering from a historical point of view, with increasing military technologies and less and less humans involved in some of them, there, I haven't heard the word asymmetrical used tonight, but that's what I've heard on NPR and the, the Washington Post of, of what domestic political influences that that might have back here with American attitudes toward intervention and, and are there any analogies with previous kinds of military technology or 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 lighter footprint uh, warfare you know any display of American power some people are going to criticize that and besides that approach um, there's a couple moral hazards that people like to point out one is this idea of the video game effect um, that, well, we, you know, randomly just go out and have a shoot 'em up against whoever's out there. Well, the numbers bear out something different. Um, number of militants killed per strike was six from 2004 to 2012. The number of civilians or unknown individuals killed per strike has declined from almost 11 from 2004 to 2007. Um, to 0 0.7 in 2011 and 0 0.1 in two, this far in 2012. So that's the first argument that kind of, by the numbers alone, and numbers and anecdotes don't tell the complete story, I understand, but by the numbers alone, that first moral hazard of, well, we're going to have this video game <coughs> approach goes away. The second one is um, that one of the questions that Sarah asked, well, we're the first country to use unmanned drones to kill enemies across borders and therefore other people will follow suit. I, you know, I just, I think proliferation's a problem for any system, and I also think that it won't be dependent upon what the U.S. does or doesn't do for someone else who feels a need for a particular technology to embrace it. We never thought that garage door openers or cell phones would be used to explode IEDs, improvised explosive devices, but they are. And so there will always be, I, you use the ter you use the term <coughs> asymmetric, so there will always be asymmet there will always be an arrow for every shield and a shield for every arrow. Um, the question is how we use small percentage of our resources today to set conditions for some uncertain future, so that as that future unfolds, instead of taking a body blow, we take a glancing blow because we set a hedge bet um, against, uh, say, state use of nuclear weapons by Pakistan, for example. Well, I think we're going to have to call it there. So um, thank you so much for coming out tonight. And I think we'll all be around for another half hour or so. Um, so thank you so much to the World Affairs Council for putting this together and President Shoup and Stephanie for getting and coordinating with all of us and to our panelists, Dr. Swift and Mr. Robbins. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.